Okay, my friends, another shocker du jour, fossil power, diatomaceous earth. What's that all about, fossil power? This is what they call diatoms. You see these little circular things? This is diatomaceous earth. This one is bentonite clay. Both of them are an earthy substance. This is much finer than the bentonite. Now I'm going to show you some things on earth that resemble these and they call these ammonites and they are extinct now. And I'll tell you why they're extinct and they know why they're extinct. It's just that they don't understand what they were when they were not extinct. I think I do. Let's take a look. Okay, let's get started. This is the fossil pure diatomaceous earth. This is food grade. You can eat this. And it's ground diatomaceous, diatomaceous earth, which is amorphous silica. All right. Now, this, as you can see, is as fine as it gets. Now, they claim this is ground up diatoms, which are little sea creatures, is their claim. We are going to look at them right now, these ammonites. What is their structure and what do they believe they were? Because they're extinct now. So let's take let's watch this video. This is the American Museum of Natural History. Okay, my friends, a natural history museum talking about ammonites. And what is an ammonite? What is it? What were they? Ammonites were shelled cephalopods. That's just a name they made up that died out about 66 million years ago. Fossil, they, so they died out, they're gone. Fossils of them are found all around the world in very large concentrations, some places, all right, where they settled out. And I'll tell you why they settled out the way they settled out. Now, the often tightly wound shells of ammonites may be a familiar sight, but how much do you know about the animals that once lived inside these shells. Well, I have a different take on this. All right, what were ammonites? Before we understood what they were, and they think they do understand what they are, one of the explanations for ammonites was that they were coiled up snakes that had been turned to stone, earning the nickname snake stones, because they found some of them that looked like this. But ammonites weren't reptiles, they were ocean-dwelling mollusks, specifically cephalopods. Not necessarily ocean-dwelling, they were on freshwater as well, because these are freshwater fossils. This is from freshwater. Uh, I think it even, yeah, right there, freshwater type amph amorphous silica, right? This is freshwater, amorphous silica. This, whoops, this is bentonite. That's sodium, sodium. That's what this stuff is, sodium. So these were the ocean dwellers, and then there was creatures on the earth that had these in them that were, were um, silica. Two different, two totally different things. So they're not specifically ocean dwellers. There's a lot they need to understand about these, and I think I can show them to you. We're going to see a little video now that explains a, a really nice little video. And, um, and then I want to show you my explanation of what these things are. And I think I can explain it completely, and I can show you examples of it right now that we can see quite clearly what they were. I'll show you. All right, I just want to make it perfectly clear. There are two types of diatomaceous earth. One of them is the food grade, which I say that you consume, suitable for consumption, and filter grade, which is inedible, but has industrial uses. But they are both basically clay. The food grade is the very, very, very fine clay. And then you get into the bentonite, which is from the ocean waters. This is, this is fresh water, the stuff that I was talking about here. All right, fresh water amorphous silica. You can't, don't inhale this. Don't, you know, be careful not to inhale this. It'll destroy your lungs. And there's a big suit going on now about that. They were letting these people cut these stone slabs, basically unprotected, and now they're, they have to have double lung transplants. It's a disaster. And they shut down, the, you know, 
these counter places that make countertops because they're making it out of this stuff that's solid, it's solidified. And again, don't get this in your lungs. So there's two different styles. One of them you can consume, one of them you can't, and also don't ever get it in your lungs. That's very important. Okay, my friends, as I said, these things belong to creatures that were just so enormous you could never imagine. That's an ammonite, which is part of a tendon anchor. This right here is an artery. That's an artery from some gigantic creature, I don't know what, and that is really the red blood that's still inside the artery. This is the other end of it right here. That's the red blood inside the artery. This can be drilled into and raw red blood can come out of there. When you put a little bit of moisture on here, this will rehydrate in a matter of seconds. And it turn right back into blood again. You see that? See the red? And that's, that's much bigger than my arm. And that is an artery. So we're talking about some big creatures and these are the remnants of their bodily tissue. You see this? This is nothing more than how the thing pulls like this and that gets pulled this way and it ends up deforming. But normally it would be completely wrapped around. But it's just extended because it's under tension. All right, these are a bunch of different styles of the, these tendons. They think they're different styles. I think they're mostly just pulled open bigger and bigger, and so they have different looking shapes to them, and they got distorted in all kinds of different ways. But primarily, they're just being elongated because of the tension. See, they're saying how many ammonite species were there. They, they, they have no idea because they think it was a creature and all of these different shapes and styles are different species. I don't necessarily agree with that, although I'm sure there were a lot of species, but a lot of them are the same species, just elongated. Okay, again, they're seeing some crazy looking things, but I think got a feeling a lot of them are just the same creature but extended or not extended or twisted or not twisted that type of thing all right so here we go they're going to be talking about an asteroid collision in a second ammonites were by the millions they were by the trillions they were everywhere 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 and i'll tell you why they were everywhere the asteroid collision at the end of the cretaceous did indeed all right who came up with that who said there was an asteroid collision at the end of the cretaceous well first of all i don't go along with their time frames the, the triassic was 450 million years ago no i don't go along with that and i don't go along with this being 66 million years ago either do not go along with that and i don't go along with an asteroid collision i do go along with the fact that we were almost hit by Venus, which caused the catastrophe on the whole Earth and destroyed literally everything on the oceans and got all the salacious ooze silicons came up from the deep salacious ooze area in the deep ocean. Because of its specific gravity, there's a, oh, I don't know, a mile or more of this salacious ooze, and it all came up super saturated the waters, which silic the silicates are what formed all these. And they would have known, never even known about this if it wasn't for the silicates, you wouldn't have all this preservation. So the silicates are the preservatives. Now, and they're saying almost, well, they say an asteroid collision. I say it was almost the Earth was hit by Venus, and so does Velikovsky, and so did every, history, every culture on the face of the planet. They all had the same story, and this didn't happen that long ago. It was very, very short time ago. And at that time, it boiled everything on the surface of the planet. They all boiled. So just like you would put our animals in a pot and boil it, they, they boiled the flesh off and they just eroded, you know, dissolved the bones and all that sort of stuff. Some things were preserved, yes, and I have some fabulously preserved stuff, but most of it created what they call a red bed, which is the, the red erosive stuff, which is the iron and the blood and all the fluids and all the fleshy stuff eroded to a red bed. Then the other marley stuff that's in the body, the you know tendons and bones and all that stuff, dissolved into a gray clay that coated the red bed. 
and then from all of that burning and all that nasty stuff and volcanism and all that stuff in the air, you, they capped it over the top with a black cap. So it's red bed, fleshy stuff, gray clay, body tissue, red bed, I mean black cap, fall out from the, from the disaster. And, and this is the area where they're finding these things is in this Triassic zone. Or what they call a Cretaceous, but it's, it's right in that whole area between the Triassic. The Triassic was earlier than this. And I have stuff here from the Triassic, and I can show you very clearly. It was nothing like they thought it was. And it wasn't that long ago. Everything I have here is on the face of the planet, I mean the face of the Earth. And um, it's all, it's already DNA tested and CAT scan and all that stuff. So my stuff is for real. And this is how I'm gonna explain this, is those were anchors in tendons. All right, stick with me. All right, check this out. This is outrageous. Somebody sent me this um, and said, you know, what do you think of this? And I said, well, it's a tendon anchor. And that is a, the, the ammonite. And I'm going to home in on here. Well, let, let me just play this and you'll see what it's all about here. This ammonite is so golden. You know, before I go any further, you see that ball in the center? There's a lot of these balls around the earth. They're called Moki marbles, which are these little black balls. But let me just continue on with this. He's talking about over 180 million years ago. No. You see that? That's a tendon anchor. That's a tendon emphasis. And out of there came that stalk. And that stalk could pull and there was give to it like a spring. Let's watch it again. Now watch what he's doing. He just cuts right there. I don't know how he knew to do it right that that spot, but the ball is right there. What he's digging away here, that's flesh. That's flesh that's just hardened up solid. Now I'm sure he's in the salt water area, I'm pretty sure. But here he goes. Can you see the nodule within the shale? You hear it thump, thump, thump? That's like a hollow stuff. It's got a lot of voids and vacuoles. Now watch this ball. He's taking it out. Now, keep your eye on this. That could be the stalk. There's going to be a stalk that comes into that, and that's where the coil is going to go. Let's keep watching. He's going to crack it. Now, usually crack right around the center of the evening. There it goes. Boom. Now watch. Let's look at this closely. Let me see if I can get a better, well, I better take a while I got it here. You see right up there? The center is where the anchor is and it's going out and it can stretch out to a cord. And I have, I could show these in the ones that we've, we have not modern ones that I, we can see quite simply. But let's go a little further with this. There it is right there. It's anchored in the center, in the ball, and now that is like a spring. When this thing was not solid rock, it would be springy. That's what all these, these curves are. And you can see when you look down into an ammonite, there's all these cavities. It's not filled with any organs or anything. It's just vacuoles, which means spaces that are, are filled with fluids. And when you crush it and pull it, it can go that way and the fluids are just going to move. And the same thing is in the interstitium. It has the same effect. All right, so that is, that's pretty cool. Look at that. Look at that. And that would have gone right out there with a strap would have attached into here. And these are like the Moki marbles. All right, here we go again. This is another one of these tendonanthesis, and they know enough now to break into these. Now, for some reason, they understand how to find the ones that have the curls in them, because I, I found a lot of tendon anchors, uh, tendon antheses, that they don't have that. But what, listen this to what he's doing huge here. This ammonite peel sticking out of this siderite block. You see that block? That's like red blood. See a bit more of the ammonite keel now.
It's looking promising so far. Let's hope the rest of the Ammonite. At one time, that wasn't solid, solid. It was working with that movable coil. That's my interpretation of this. It's within the stone. Same thing, right on the equatorial ridge. We've exposed everything that's been preserved, but unfortunately there wasn't a centre. We'll keep having a look and hopefully we find something much better. All right, they come in blocks of like a whole batch of them at once. Hold on, I got some shots of it. Hold on. All right, so let's go back to the what they claim was an asteroid collision. I say it was when Venus almost hit Earth. Read Emanuel Velikovsky, Worlds in Collision. Did everywhere on a planet, he went to every single culture. All of the stories had the same story. Almost hit by a fiery comet that later turned out to be Venus. Now, and that's why they were so obsessed with the skies. Now, I'm going to let him continue. He's saying that at this asteroid collision wiped them all out. The Ammonites, and perhaps had that asteroid collision not occurred, the Ammonites would still be living on the planet. That was called the Great Dying. Everything died. Basically everything on the planet. And, and Yale agrees with this whole, all of this. They agree with, with, with everything. And my mud fossils. My mud fossils are perfectly preserved, soft-bodied creatures. So an ammonite is a kind of cephalopod. Modern cephalopods today are cuttlefish and squids and octopus. The difference between all of those and ammonites is that ammonites had external shells. That's one of the reasons they're such good fossils. All right, look at this. These are cavities. These are not big body organs or anything here. This is an anchor, and when you turn it like this, it, these things, these cavities would squish around. So it's going to stretch, and they show them very stretched out. With ammonites, the shape that you typically associate is a planar spiral shell. But in fact, they came in many, many different shapes. Well, first of all, yes and no. They did come in many, many shapes, I agree with that. But they also came in many, many stretches. So in other words, this is a relaxed anchor. And that's what it is, it's a, a tendon anchor. And that's relaxed. Now, if that was pulled and stretched, it would be under tension. Because that's basically what they are, as anchors. And they could, you can pull against them. The scaphites start with a closely coiled shell, and then as they approach maturity, they develop a straight all right, they're just saying that they've seen them like this, but all that is, is it's pulled apart. And I'm going to show you something that's going to knock your socks completely off. That's provided you have socks on to start with. This, my friends, and all of this I'm showing you, with all of these little Great straps. Part. And then there's a point of recurvature, you see and then they curve back into a hook. Baculites departed from the... Let me just show you something. This is going to be very, very hard for the average mind to accept, but I, I can show you it's quite true. All right, now pay a close attention. My claim is that those little balls that they're pulling these straps, or they, they crack them and they show these little forms, are these balls right here. Now these are in a creature's body and they are literally everywhere. And a lot of them have eroded, but they're all over the place, and most of them are very small. The bigger ones is the ones that they're showing these ammonites. Now, those balls are in tissue like this. This is obviously a very blown up looking thing. And that's the skin, and underneath you run into the tissue and all those little black balls lock this tissue into position so that it can move and pull this way and that way, but it'll come back. Now, this is called interstitium. And down deep inside, it looks similar to this. It has these little straps and these balls are all inside the fleshy stuff. 
Alright, guess what? These, whoops, these right here are those balls. They call them the Moki Marbles. Alright, those are these balls right here. That's my claim. This could be tested. Now, those balls are the inside central ball and the rest of the stuff is eroded away and turned into mud and then just washed away and left the balls laying around here. And these have a certain chemistry to them which can be checked. Now, I don't know if these are going to have the little coils inside them because some of them didn't. A lot of them, most of them didn't. Um, but they're finding them. Now, I, I, this is over in Hunstanton Beach in um, Hunstanton Cliffs in the United Kingdom. Now, this is all the mud, which is the red fleshy stuff that's run off. That is literally skin or interstitium. Um, it's, um, it's basically skin. It's a, a fascia, that type of thing. Now, all of these balls were in the wall, and that's how these things could move around and stretch and do all this and that, but the skin would be on top and these things would do all this stuff when it was alive. Well, when it's dead, it's just dead. Now the water's washing and washing and washing and washing and coming into more and more and more clean flesh and then the residue is the balls. They have to go somewhere and there they are. Now, because they don't, they're good for a long time. They, they don't go bad. Now, if you broke these open, I'm not sure what you'd find. But I'm sure somebody's going to do it. <laughs> and I'd like to know what the outcome is. Now, um, again, that is, these things are absolutely enormously gigantic, the things on Earth. That is some kind of skin or a, an organ or something that's got a little bit of flesh under there. I mean, this is just my, minuscule to the body complete. The body complete would be just, phew, just think about it. And that's what we're dealing with. And that's not just here. Because what I'm going to show you is this. And these. On Mars. Alright, check this out. This is Tyson. Tyson Carlson. And Tyson's Mud Fossil Adventures. This is one of these balls. And there's, you can basically see the center. You can almost like see it wrapping around. And then you end up with this strap going through that hole there. Anchoring this to somewhere so it could flush around. This is the kaolinite clay or kaolin clay or the, this other stuff, the diatomaceous earth. It's very, very fine powdery clay. And that's one of the anchors that was in this skin. You have to have anchors and that's a good sized ball. I'd like to see what's inside of them. Now, uh, what else do I have to show you? This I want to show you because Hold on one second, I have to call up some pictures, but I want to show you this, and you can think about this as I'm getting ready here. You see how all these things are all squishy together, and they're all squishy together, and then they're all stretched out here? You see that? And then we're going to look at these extremely close. All right. And we're going to pay attention to what he was showing in that video about these shapes. Remember I said some of them are going to have different looking shapes, but they're still from the same source. You see this here? You see this all stretched out? You see that little hook to it? I'm seeing all kinds of things that he was showing, saying they're different, they're different types, but and they might be. But I'm seeing things here that show that the same, same ones, they're all from the same batch here, can look quite significantly different. All, right, all twisted up and turned up and all that and when they get real crunched together they can be all balled up you see it all right and it could be even worse than that this is this is to me it looks like sort of relaxed and everything's good but you can pull this way or that way or any way you want and the reason I know this is up on Mars is because of the sedimentation here. There's no way in the world that you're going to get this kind of, of texture on Earth. From, from, you know, it would have to be microscopic, but this is huge. I know this is huge. And these things here are the tendon anchors. And there is not one bit of, of 
moisture erosion here. Not a single drop has hit this. That's impossible in the desert. Even in the desert, you're going to get downpours, and you're going to see all kinds of patterns of erosion. This is not nothing, not, not a single one. And that's what's going on up on Mars. There's just no atmosphere to speak of. And that happened because of the impact of Venus into the into Mars. It actually hit Mars and scraped the whole huge side of the thing. So I think it's called a Mars Valleanus or it's a it's a big huge crater all the way across. It goes as far as the United States is wide. And it's deep too. And it just wiped out all the atmosphere and, and killed everything on the planet. Virtually the same thing that happened to our planet. Only Venus didn't hit us. It did hit on Mars. And that's when all the extinctions happened on them and on our planet. It was the great flood here on Earth, and up on Mars it was the great end of life. All right, as remember I told you, there's two different types of the diatomaceous Earth, which is the fresh water balls and, and those little ammonites. And then there's the bentonite, and I believe that's from ocean like this, the dark stuff. Bentonite is dark. The um, Diatomaceous is really pure white. Now, that's those balls. Look at this. This is fresh water. All right. So this is not not ocean. All right. You see all those balls? Moss loves these balls. It loves to grow on. Even the ones that I just showed you here. The other ones in. Um, in the United Kingdom. That's stuff growing on there. That's that's plant life adhering to those balls. It's not a plant growing and creating this, these balls. Those balls are coming out of a wall. And that, that's what these balls are, is being invaded by some kind of something that likes to eat whatever's in there, salty stuff. Because these don't have salt in them. They have bloody whatever. Look at them all over the place. Look way back up here everywhere. That's because these creatures were so enormously large. Okay, my friends, most of you probably know about Enoch and his books about the giants and about going to heaven and being taken by God and all that. Now, there's another book called the Colburn Bible, which was very similar to the, it's as big as the King James Bible. And it was written long, long, long ago, talking about the destroyer will appear and mountains will open up and belch forth fire and flames. Trees will be destroyed, which they were because the, the cellulose broke down. All living things will be engulfed. Waters will be swallowed up by the land and seas will boil. This is the key. Seas boiling created all of these things that I'm talking about. And these texts, every single one of them had the same story. And even the, the academics agree there was a great asteroid impact. Well, that's what they say. It was Venus, I believe. Now, it could have been something else because there are some other planets they're talking about. This um, Nibiru, possibly. And there's a couple other names they threw out there. But... Um, could this happen again? Well, I don't see why it couldn't. And is this true? I don't see why it's not true. Everything I have discovered points to the fact that we were almost impacted by Venus. But Venus literally was born, literally born with a, just a normal, like, basic birth out of Jupiter. And Jupiter has a literal vagina, just like a woman does. And it's a great red spot. It's not just a red spot. It is a vagina. That I've shown them over and over and over again. So this is the Colburn Bible again. And this is all about Noah. Noah starts to build his ark using the moon's orbit and the red dust as a signal to begin. Noah's tales carry some interesting suggestions for those concerned about self-sufficiency. Again, I quote the Colburn. And this is all the Colburn Bible text. And it talks about Noah building his ship and um, how it was built and how big it was and they had no mast or oars and um, they had cisterns of water and food and they brought up you know all the animals just like it says in the, in the Christian text 
And um, all of them had the same story, a great flood. It's not something that's unknown. It's just something we have to take seriously. And then it says, with the dawning, men saw an awesome sight, riding on a black, great black roiling cloud came the destroyer. And he almost hit the earth, and it caused all this havoc. All right, there's no question whatsoever giants existed. This one here is a fingertip from one that is DNA tested. This has been CAT scanned. That's the apical tuft right there. You can see that little round spot is the apical tuft. This is where the tendon locks in on a side. These are the tendons coming up the side, and that's the bone. It's been CAT scanned, DNA tested. So that yielded DNA. It was degraded, but it was still no question whatsoever human DNA. Human. Modern human. This is a hair follicle, and of this there is no question. That right there is where the erector pili muscle attaches, right there. This side is the sebaceous gland. You see it's all sloppy up here. Originally it went way up here, that whole piece, but it slid down basically. And it's laying here now, instead of up higher. That's why it's all goopy around the top. Slid down now. So that's this. This is the root ball coming down, and that, those two spots right there are the vein and artery. Now, I would be very surprised if you couldn't get some kind of DNA out of this, if it was drilled into deep enough. Although there's not a lot of blood, you know, that's the spot where the blood is. So, this right down here is where we got the vein and artery coming in. So I would say, if you drilled right in, follow those tubes, you should hit some blood. Something that's going to have some DNA signature. It may not be complete, but it should tell you what kind of a creature this was from. That's all you have to know, it's the type of creature. And this was from a modern human, all right, Homo sapiens. And I have the DNA tests, I have the CAT scans, and this is just one of three that I had done. So this is not something that's impossible to do, it's just that it's not well taken in the academic, because it, it, it ruins everything they've been saying. If there was creatures this big, just think about how big, this is a thousand times bigger than a human one. This is two inches wide. And the width of a normal hair follicle in a human being is two thousandths of an inch. So this is two inches, that means it's a thousand times bigger than what ours is. A thousand times. If you're a five foot tall person even, you're a mile tall. That's a mile tall person would have this kind of a hair. Now I don't know what kind of creature it's from, but there's no, nothing around that has a hair follicle that size. <laughs> That's just way off the charts. But all this other stuff is too. All of these balls that I showed you with those straps inside of them are from giant creatures. Look at, look at the size of these balls with these little straps. And in us, you need an electron microscope to see it. I think I've shown pretty well enough to cover my bases here. And up on the Mars, you see these here? You see that little hooky thing? You see them looking a little different here? Like if you saw that, and that's all you saw was this from here back to here, you would think that was a, a, a normal shape. You see them? They all pretty much have this when they get stretched. Well, that's what they're finding, these, and then they call them a certain thing. And then they're seeing them with these little spirals coming down, and they call them something else. And then they see them with a big long piece coming down, and they call them something else. And then they see them that's just balls by themselves, and they call them something else. So what it boils down to, they're basically all a very similar thing. But the balls are a lot of different balls because everywhere you lock into your body, all right, you have these balls. So here it is right here. Where are we? Okay, so here we go. These are tendons, right? You see the enthesis? These are the enthesis, the, where the enthesis strap goes down to meet these balls. The balls are the things we're talking about that have the little squirrely thing inside of them. Now, I don't know where those are in your body, 
but they're in, where they lock into certain types of bones, they have a certain style and they have a certain outside look to them and they have a certain inside to them too. Some of them are all lattice work and stuff, it's crazy. Now, then you got a ligament. You see a ligament here? That's two bones locked together. It's like this bone. I got one around here somewhere. It's like a bone like this. Right, latched into a wrist. You see it? Alright, that's what a ligament does. Two bones attached together. If you ever see in you know, the deserts and stuff where they show these big stones sticking out of the ground and a little tiny stalk going in the ground they can't push it over, it's one of these. Because that's got a ball on here and it's got a ball in here. So if that's the surface of the earth, that ball sticking up, it's not going to go anywhere because that stalk is tough, tough. They don't, they don't go bad. That's why your bones don't fall apart. These things are very well designed. But all of these, you see the, the different styles here, and then you got all kinds of different tendons because you got hip, hip type things, and you got ankles, and you got you know your joints and your fingers and your t tips of your toes and everything else they're all different because they all have a different type of grip signature and a, a tension signature and sometimes they have to actually flex and they're not solid balls sometimes they're solid they're not going to flex I, I got dozens and dozens of different um, pictures primarily I have a, a bunch of specimens too but the pictures are fabulous to see and uh, I, I, I have those coming out of my ears because I've been collecting them for 15 years. And I, I have people sending me things all the time, all the time. And that's why, like, I can show you all these things. And these are the Moki marbles. These are exactly the same thing that's up on Mars, on the Mo Mars blueberries. And they have the same straps here. Here on Earth, they erode. You, you're never going to see these straps. Uh, not never, but you're not going to see them like you did up there on Mars. That is just stunningly fabulous. And that skin is not stretched anywhere. But it could go this way, it could go that way, it could go this way. It's, all, it's a nice system. But once it's stretched out, that's what happens. Pinched together, stretched out. And like I said, you're going to see all these different patterns. And then they're going to call them different names. All right, so let's go back to our ammonite guy here. The planet's spiral coil altogether. They formed a straight shell. The Nipponites are ammonites. Well, here, let me go back a little bit. As they, approach, as they approach maturity, they develop a straight part. And then there's a point of curvature and then they curve back into a hook. Baculites departed from the planet's spiral coil altogether. They formed a straight shell. The Nipponites are ammonites that the worlds just begin to meander in ways that seem irregular and unpredictable. Turlidid. The, the, the Nipponites are, are from Japan. They're unusual, and I, I, I'm not sure what to make of them, but um, they're unusual. Irregular and unpredictable. Turlidids begin to look a little like snail shells. There's ones that are like paper clips that'll have but one shaft that will double back on itself. They probably all together about 30 different shapes of, of ammonites. Now don't forget, my allegation is that some of these are just pulled and stretched and like that, but they're just the same structure, but they, they didn't grow like that and live like that when they were alive because they were inside of, of these tendon balls and they were flexible. They were allowed to give you a little bit of tension on these tendons. That's how a tendon works. It, it, it appears to me that this is a little different than the tendons we have now. The tendons we have now are built in blocks and they, they actually just give a little tiny bit to tendon, but it's, it's, it's inside of its own self. These look like you had a strap coming down and this is where you got your little tension is to unwrap that a little bit. It looks like it's a different design, but I'm not sure of that. Here it goes. 
evolutionary biologists at the turn of the 19th century thought, wow, look at all these funny things going on with the ammonites. They figured that these funny shapes must have indicated something was very wrong with the ammonites, with the gene pool of ammonites, and this presaged their ultimate extinction. So nothing could be far from the truth. They were very well adapted to what they were doing, since people didn't realize what they were doing, which was floating around and probably eating the zooplankton. These different shapes are a good example of, of how evolution works. Evolution is open to lots of different pathways, so you have a lot of freedom to explore these, but there are constraints. You can begin to map out all the directions that evolution will foster and encourage. It's kind of inspiring and, and wondrous to see what was permissible and how is it that all of these can work. Exactly. As I'm showing, I believe that these were inside of tendon emphasis and they were a precursor to actual tendons, which are built, the strap of the tendons have that flexibility in it now. Back then, it looks like there was just a strap and this did the uncurling, which gave it the, te you know, just enough tension to do this. That's what it looks like to me. I don't think they're made this way anymore, but I, I could be wrong. Okay, my friends, things are really starting to come together, surprisingly enough. I have had a bunch of people contact me to give me help. Now, Paul Amatucci is writing the books. So we have a whole batch of new books coming out, or they're already out. But you can go up on Amazon and just look it up. I have nothing to do with the books whatsoever. He's writing them based on my papers. So he's the guy, if you want to talk to us, Paul Amatucci. But you can go up on Amazon look up Paul Amatucci. He's got a whole batch of books of his own, too. But he liked my research. He said, can I write some books about it? I said, yeah, go ahead. So he's doing that. Now, so there's our library is getting started, and I'm working on a a textbook, a real like textbook. Now, so we got that going, and I've been doing the presentations on the YouTube, but I'm going to try to get a little better at that now. Um, and we've been doing research on bacteria and all of these different mud fossil transformations, which happens to all of these different types of body tissues under certain different conditions. And all that's pretty much been identified now is the fascia and the um, interstitium and the hot boiling flood and all that stuff. So we got that going. Now, we got the books, we got a motto, and if you haven't heard it yet, I don't think I've said it yet. <laughs> It's, uh, the motto is going to be one small step for mankind, one giant leap for the human mind. <laughs> no, so we got a motto. Now, you know what else we got? We got a song. Harold Peterson sent me this song, and it is good. I like it. So we got videos, we got song, we got models, we got a books, we just got a school online, we got research going on into the bacteria and all these other things, we got these presentations. We need to have meetups in your areas where you get together with people and you say, let's go down to the brook, let's go down to a brook or a creek or wherever you got around there and look at the rocks. The ones that are washed away, all the stuff, you, you can find them. It's like that. You find all kinds of stuff. And everybody could have a good time. Wow, look what I found. Look what I, the kids would love it, I'm telling you. I would have loved to know what I know now when I was looking at all these things early. Because I used to do, we, we used to call rock hunting, rock, I forget what we called it, to be honest with you. But I had one of those little picks that had a little point on it. We'd crack open this and that. So anyway, that you should do these meetups. All right? Get people around your area, like the boys' clubs, that type of thing. All right? So now, we need to also have a question and answer online. Even like run it 24 hours, who cares? But we need to have somebody probably monitoring it. I don't know. I, this is that stuff, I don't like to get involved in it, but we need to do that. We need to have people be able to display their wares, so to speak. And, and ask questions about them. Say, what do you think this is? And everybody's going to have little arguments and who knows what they're going to do. But 
these are the kind of things we need to do. And, you know, because this, is, this is really strange, changes virtually everything. If you accept the premise that I'm talking about, this, this was not that old, that these creatures were gigantic creatures, there's dragons, there's monsters, there's, there, 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 and, and there are. The dragons all over the place, and the, the giants were just huge everywhere. And that I also, it's, this is not a question anymore. The, the the thing is denial, and that's what this song is about. Wait, do you hear this? And as you do, as you watch it, I'm going to pan through some pictures. All right, here we go. Harold Peterson. This is a nice song. I like it. Thank you, Harold, my friend. I love it. 